You're listening to Heating Up the UK, a Miami Heat UK based podcast, bringing you the best heat media guests every single week. Here's your host, Dan Healy, brought to you by at the Miami Heat UK social media network. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to episode 49 of Heating Up the UK, a Miami Heat UK based podcast. I am your host, Dan Healy. Before we come on to today's episode, please just check out all the content that we provide across all social media networks at the Miami Heat UK, plus our YouTube channel, Miami Heat UK TV. We have free shows on there, the Heat Hub, the Heat Film Room, Tepid Takes, and of course our live game day from the UK pre-game stream before each and every Miami Heat game also check out the website www.miamiheatuk.com for all videos articles and fun and games on to today's episode and i'm delighted to be joined by a sports anchor and reporter at wplg mr clay ferraro clay how are you sir i'm doing great dan i, I love that tepid takes that's fantastic <laughs> yeah you know what's funny is like over here everybody wants to throw out the hot takes and like that's how you get clicks and and yes. and listens and downloads and all that and you know i think the reality is that hey normally the tepid takes are the ones that are usually closer to reality on a lot of these things yeah. so that's cool this, this is it yeah it's good fun to show that one if you don't see it check it out <laughs> it is good fun it looks at the wider nba issues clay you join me at a great time it is the morning after the night before Well, what a trade deadline we experienced. I cannot remember a more dramatic, more tense, more nervous day um, over the last 24 hours that we had, especially those last few hours. I had to recharge my phone twice during that time (laughs) because of the amount of refreshing I was doing. Um, Tell us about your experience with this. Obviously, it ended up with, as we know, Victor Oladipo and Amanda Belitza joining. We'll get into this properly, but for you, for when we came down to the last 10 minutes we didn't know whether we was getting one player multiple players <laughs> no players at all for me it was crazy how was your experience with it you know it's it's funny because we were working on our we so we have newscasts at three o'clock four o'clock five o'clock and six o'clock in the afternoon and early evening uh on the abc affiliate in miami and so we're will manso and i are sitting there and we're like going back and forth but okay how are we going to do this if they don't make a move and, and by that point they had already secured Bielitsa. so like yes. we had him in so it was like okay what <laughs> where do we put Bielitsa if they don't get somebody but you know and then three o'clock comes and goes and you're looking at it and you're like Okay, and then Bobby Mark sends out that tweet. Hey, just an FYI, a lot of times, you know, there's a there's a long queue on the trade calls, and so there's probably going to be a bit of stuff coming down after that. And you know, it, it felt all day. So so you have like this this ending, and then you immediately have to go, and you have to have these contingency plans worked out in your head. Talking strictly from a work perspective, you, you kind of have to talk through what are your what are your contingency plans if they do nothing? What are your contingency plans if they get Lowry? What if they get Oladipo? And, you know, you you heard a couple of other names throughout the day. So you're kind of trying to figure out so that you can jump and have a plan of action and not have to figure out what you're going to do after it becomes official. So, um, you know, and the world has changed so much now to where, you know, we're not only doing that, but we're also writing up stories, like contingency stories to put up on our website, which is background on the player. So um, that was from our perspective. So, so strictly from a work perspective, uh, there's the boring background there. Um, I, I, it was fascinating to me seeing how the reports trickled out throughout the day. And I, I think it was probably around 11 a.m. East Coast time. And, you know, obviously speaking East Coast time here yep. in the United States. Um 11 a.m., 11.30, that you had this report out of Toronto that the Sixers are in the Lowry deal and it's at the one-yard line. Yeah. And it, it just it started to feel over the next couple of hours that, man, I don't – it just feels like there's a lot of leverage plays going on here. And and so for the whole day, it, it shaped up, and this is ultimately what it turned out to be. It was a staring contest between Pat Riley and, and the Toronto Raptors front office, whether that was Masai Ujiri or – um, you know, who I, I would imagine Ujiri would be making the final call there. And it, it ended up that they were staring at each other right up until after three o'clock. Meanwhile, while that's going on, Pat's on the phone with Houston and, and that's how it ended up going down. 
Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, um, yeah, when you saw those the, the back and forth through those last that, that last hour or so with that tweet that went out saying that Philly looked like they was at the one yard line, and then it was quickly sort of Miami are still in the chase and that anything can happen. That was minutes later from the same account, and you start to think, yeah, you we know, what are these tweets doing? Are they there for leverage, etc.? Does anybody really know what's happening? I think when it was always going to be a deal with Pat Riley, uh, Messiah, and um, and Daryl Morey. That's three pretty guys that really are used to getting their own way. And um, yeah, I, th- I think that um, it was you're absolutely right. It was a staring contest. I think Pat had obviously his trade in mind that was never going to budge. And I'm not sure whether Toronto believed it. And it came down to it where um, they decided, OK, well, if we're not going to put in the piece that we want, which we believe was Tyler Hero, then we're not willing to do the deal. And therefore he stays a wrapped up. But what I like best about this deal Obviously, we, we, we did pivot quickly onto Depot and we'll come on to that in a minute. But the fact that, um, you know, Miami didn't get Carl Larry is disappointing because I love the player. I think he's a perfect fit. But I'm more happy at the fact that the 76ers and the Lakers didn't acquire him. That, for me, is just as big. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. And especially when you're looking towards the summer. And, you know, so the, the Heat are going to have a few options now. They're going to get Victor Oladipo in their building for the next, you know, what, three months or whatever it is, four months, and and figure out, OK, is is he one of the players that we want to lock into long term? And and if not, then you try to work something out with Lowry. Maybe there's some cat mechanics where you sign you you sign and trade and and find a way to to work out the cap to where you get both I mean there's there's a number of different things out there that they put it this way Andy Ellisberg whatever it is that can be done Andy Ellisberg invented it so <laughs> the, to your point the fact that he didn't end up going to LA he didn't end up going to Philadelphia you know, not just that he didn't strengthen any contenders for the the short term, but the fact that he's not going to get used to those places and and potentially fall in love with somewhere else and re-sign there now. So if he's not in Toronto's long-term plans, which it still doesn't appear that he is because they've got Fred Van Fleet there and, and making a lot of money now, it would make a lot more sense for him now to kind of go to the place that he reportedly wanted to go all along, which was Miami. Mm. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good point, and um, you know, it it did. It was such such a strange final ten minutes to that because you saw Toronto was continually, you know, they was they was creating roster spots, they were sending players out. Um, so you really thought that it was going to happen. Um, but as I said, when we got to that deadline. And uh, yeah, you, we didn't know where, where it was going to go, whether it was going to be one, two or no players at all. But do you think that there was any noise that there was perhaps in the plans of Pat Riley, etc., that there was actually plans to try and do both players, Carl Lowry and Victor Oladipo? Given what they what they gave up for Oladipo, like it's certainly you could have made that happen. I mean, let's let's just say hypothetically that they had been willing to budge on Hero and, and clearly they were not. Um, but it's not, you heard enough of Toronto potentially being interested in Precious Achua. Um, and, and Duncan Robinson's name was thrown out so much that the, the poor guy sent a text message to, I think it was, was Ramona Shelburne, uh, at ESPN basically said, I don't even know if I can take my nap. Yeah. Uh, and you know, so whatever was there was not part of the deal with Houston. Uh, I don't think Olenek would have been a part of that. Obviously, you would have had to find a way to make salaries work. Um, and maybe ultimately you would have had to give up Iguodala, which, by the way, I'm happy that they didn't have to do that. I, yeah. um, I just think he's going to be a big contributor down the line in, in these late game situations when you're going up against some of the playoff teams that I'm sure we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, I, I think that, that there's always that pie in the sky possibility and Pat Riley always thinks big. And yet, after hearing him talk after the game last night, it became pretty clear that he said he had no interest in giving up either Robinson or Hero. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about Robinson, and you know that you could be kind of like parsing statements there that, well, I didn't have any interest in it, but if I had to, dot dot dot. You know what I mean? And and, yeah. and so, but he made it sound last night as though he didn't want to give up either player. And he especially was talking about Hero after his 29-point performance last night, just essentially saying, look, we don't know what this guy's ceiling is. So yeah, I'm sure there was a thought, and, and I think the way the deal was constructed with Houston, where they gave up practically nothing, and, and it would have left open the possibility that they would have done that. Um, but ultimately, it, it feels like Riley's desperation may have been a little overstated, that you know, I, I think there's always been this feeling with him that he's 76 years old and 
you know, he's not going to wait out young players' growth and development. And, you know, what you saw last night is, is that's, that's not the case. He feels very strongly and convicted about these young players, and he's not going to let them walk out of the building, uh, you know, unless it's for a real star. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, I think there is that thing that maybe people do understate the fact that he might just be in. He's always said he wants one more championship and then he'll ride out into the sunset. And I think that maybe some people do think that, that that's going to force him into a rush move. And last night proved absolutely against the case that he just would not blink on um, on his trade offer and that was it and you know it now leaves Kyle Lowry in Toronto which I don't think he'll have any problem with he's obviously a, <laughs> a, a superstar out there and he's a he's a, the, the best uh, player that that franchise has ever had he's loved but um, will he be I don't know whether disappointed is the right word but he sort of he said his goodbyes almost he had that incredible last yeah. game where he'd done this plus 42 or something net rating game for Toronto yeah. uh, it seemed like it was the farewell game and now it's not will there be any bad feeling there at all I can't imagine it would be no I, I'm with you I, I don't think there would be I, I think he he'd probably already started thinking though about hey I mean he and Jimmy Butler are, are buddies and yeah. so I, I'm sure that there had been you know those conversations and okay you know if and when we get together we can do things this way and so I, I'm sure he had started to think about that but you know he was on the zoom call after that that game where he had that crazy rating I think it was against Denver right and yeah. he uh he he said look you guys know I'm always honest with you talking to the media. I I don't bleep you. I don't like, I, I forget, uh, bull crap, whatever you want to say. He, he <laughs> used a word we won't use on your podcast. Um, but uh, he said, I have no clue what's going on. He said, I really don't. I can't sit here right now and tell you that I have any inkling of what's, of what's going on here. And so I, I do think that, that, he probably had envisioned uh, his last couple of months as being a chance to make a real run. And I think he would have gotten that in Miami more likely than, than certainly he will with the Raptors. Um, and yet I, this is temporary. And, you know, four, mo four months from now, he's going to get to explore his free agency just as he would have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that there might be the slight disappointment that he, he's not going to now have a run at a championship because Toronto are probably not going to be contending this year. Um, but as I said, I don't think that uh, he'll, he'll get over it very quickly knowing that he's just got a few months before he can then choose where his destination will be. On to uh, the player that we, the players that we did acquire then and incredibly the last minute pivot over to, to Houston for Oladipo for Mo, sorry, for uh, Kelly Olinick, Avery Bradley, and a 2022 pick swap. That deal um, will go down really <laughs> as the ultimate no risk, high reward oh, man. Uh, deal we could have ever have dreamt up, surely. And have you seen some of the, the aggregates of, of what Houston ultimately got in return for James Harden? Because of, you know, when you kind of do, like, do the math and work out all the deals and you know, it's it, it, it makes you if, if you're a Heat fan, you got to be thankful that you know you have a, a front office and an organization that that knows what it's doing. And you know, I I can understand. I, and look, I'm with you. I really like Lowry, and I really like what he would have brought to this franchise. I feel like they were kind of missing. It, it felt like last year. You know, Jimmy gets there, and there's like this immediate culture change. Not that the Heat needed a culture change, but it was almost like a a shot in the arm, right? Like a, a kick in the pants. Like, hey, oh no, this is how we do things here because this is who I am. Well, that's who Kyle Lowry is too. Yeah. And you know, I, I think having that sort of energy in the building would have been enormous. The thing about Oladipo though is he instantly becomes the second most talented player on the Heat behind Bam Adebayo. And, you know, Jimmy Butler is somebody who talks all the time. You know, when he was in Minnesota, I think he said he was the third most talented player on that team with Carl Anthony Towns and, and Andrew Wiggins. And I think he's right. Talent is one thing. Making good on it is another. And mm -hmm. what's fascinating to me is, you know, you have Victor Oladipo, who all-NBA player a few years ago, then, then he has the injuries, the torn quad in particular – and I, now I don't know if he's ever going to be like the, the slam dunk champion contender. I think he finishes the runner up. I don't know that he's going to be that guy, but he doesn't have to be. You know, I think what he can be here is he can be an extremely talented, as, as Riley said last night, slasher, creator, uh, get his own shot, get shots for, for his teammates. And if he comes in and, you know, instantly buys into what the Heat do, and I think he will because he's wanted to be here forever. I mean, I've, yeah. I've been here since 2014, and I feel like I've heard his name every single year since 
since I've been here. And so, you know, he, he's somebody who clearly wants to make an impression. And if he shows up and, and he buys in and, and that talent is paired with, with finding the scheme fit. And I, I mean, you could ultimately end up with the better long-term player because of his age and also because of his talent level than even you would have gotten with Lowry. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we talked about this on one of our pregame streams and we said, you know, we know that it's who the two targets are. We expect it to be one or the other. And we said, you know, the, the great thing about this deal is that Victor Oladipo, as you just said there, he's always wanted this move. We, it seems like it's a match made in heaven. Um, so, but the best thing is, is that he's got this audition to, where, where the Heat can really see what he can do because he, he, we've seen what he can do in the past, but maybe not seen enough of it. Uh, he had that one incredible season uh, in, in Indiana. We haven't seen him maybe repeat that so much. Um, but we've got this perfect opportunity now where we can trial this. And if it works successful, well, then he's going to get a long-term, um, you know, sensible payday out of this. So it is, as I just said, it's, it's the lowest risk for the highest reward for me. Um, big, big time. And, and not to, before you go on to Bielitsa, the one thing I want to mention about Depot too is, man, defensively. And yeah. and like you watched last night, the the game, and, and we're recording this on, on Friday afternoon, our time, Friday evening, your time. So you watched that game against Portland and there were times down the stretch where, man, you could have really used, obviously a Jimmy Butler back out there, but man, you could have used an extra on-ball defender when you're going up against one of those teams. And like, if you end up running into Brooklyn in the playoffs, Imagine being able now to roll out Oladipo, Jimmy Butler, Trevor Ariza, Andre Iguodala, and Bam Adebayo. I mean, you've just got, you've got five guys who are long, rangy, quick, athletic, switchy, smart. Like, and, and so I, I feel like as, as much as we're going to talk about the offensive side of this and you know, maybe who Depot was, the high-flying, slam-dunk artist, uh, all-NBA player, the defensive part of this, man, is the biggest thing for me because I'm sure I'm not alone, but it got a little tiresome watching uh, guards being taken advantage of on the defensive end of the floor over and over again, not just last night, but at other points in the season. And now that's not going to happen anymore. And, and I'm sure that's what Riley and Spo were thinking too. Yeah, definitely. It's absolute, as you say, you list off those names, it is Clamp City. If we need to make a stop, there's so many options now that we can throw out there. And this is already a good defensive team before the acquisition of the of Oladipo. So that's really exciting. So, yeah, just quickly going back, we said about, um, you know, whether we would want the, the the one or two years of Lowry or potentially three or four years of Oladipo. And we was really split on that. Um, again, if it, I mean, it may come to a, a, a decision here where we do end up with both who knows what happens in the summer but um you know we can't be if we look at this and we do get the Ola Depot of old uh there's going to be a, a decent contract there for maybe three to four years first of all do you see that that would maybe in the long term be the better run of maybe two years of Kyle um who's obviously a much older player as well Ola Depot still being well and truly in his prime um and do, do you think that that what sort of number would he maybe be looking at commanding here and that's a great question, numbers wise. And I'd have to look at it and, and figure out, <laughs> excuse me, the cap economics of it. And, and I'm not sure. What I do know is that, <laughs> you know, you hear the hometown discount thing all the time. And I, I think that's completely garbage. Like any one of us in our in our business, in our lines of work, we wouldn't take a hometown discount, right? I mean, like you got you got a family, you got whatever. I certainly, I certainly wouldn't. Um, and yet I think being in a place where he's wanted to be for a long time. I think there are some ways that maybe he'd be willing to be flexible with Miami uh, because he would want to be there. He, he would want to, to look out for the long-term good of this franchise because it would mean long-term security for him as well. Um, so, you know, and, and Pat Riley has a way of being really persuasive when, uh, when he's sitting there in a the room with you. So could it be better than the Lowry thing? Yes, it could. And, and I think that's where you're, you're betting on the high end of this. And now with that said, if you were to tell me that, you know, you were sitting there and you were making the choice between, well, you were just, making the choice between Victor Oladipo and uh, Kyle Lowry for the exact same offer, like right now, I'd still probably lean Lowry because he's yeah. a more known commodity, a known, more, more known quantity. Yeah. And yet if you're talking about upside for what you gave up, I, I, and and what potential? So it's one of those things where you know you talk about the low risk. It it could be you know he's going to help you regardless. He may not be as good as Kyle Lowry right now, yeah. and he may not be as good even long term if if he never gets back to the player that he was. But he may also be a bit better, 
And, and that's kind of that, that, that variance there that you're betting on. And that maybe if you had to give up a hero or a Duncan Robinson, you wouldn't feel as good about taking that sort of a risk, but for what you gave up, man, you're, you're betting on the upside. You're betting on the person that Victor Oladipo is that he's going to come in and, and buy in and, and be the player um, that's going to maximize the potential that he does still have even after the injury. Yeah, hundred percent. It's exciting times. And also we, we talk about excitement. I now look at this roster. I mean, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, Victor Oladipo, Goran Dragic, Tyler Hero, Duncan Robinson, Kendrick Nunn, Andre Iguodala, Precious Chatua, Trevor Ariza, Nemanja Bilitsa, Casey Parla, Gabe Vincent, Max Struess, and then obviously UD. We've probably getting uh, Lamarcus Aldridge as well in the buyout. That seems like that's uh, very much touted as happening. That is literally stacked to the very bottom, isn't it? I mean, um, it's now... Wow, I mean, you look at players like Kendrick Nunn, for example. He, he uh, you know, is a player that has been so up and down, um, has rode the roller coaster, rode the wave recently of uh, imagine to get himself back into this lineup. With Oladipo there now, with Dragic coming back as well, Duncan Robinson is still on this team. Um, he's maybe one of the players that we're not going to see so much of. But if you, even if you're looking at him coming in as an eighth, ninth, tenth man. I mean, man, what other teams in the NBA can offer this? No, and, and also the, the thing about Nunn, and I don't know if he gets enough credit for this, and, and I think it was actually Ethan Skolnick who said this, that people within the Heat organization were blown away. They've never had a player who accepted a diminishing role with as great of an attitude as Nunn did yeah. and then bounced back afterwards to – to make good on, on his promise and, and go back to being close to the player that he was before his, his role was diminished. And, you know, I think part of you look at the, the number of, of quality players on this team, you know, the playoffs are one thing and, you know, you're going to get to a rotation of six, seven, maybe eight guys that you feel really good about come playoff time. But I think the, the real key to having the depth that this team has right now is, man, you, you don't want to have to play Jimmy Butler on both nights of a back-to-back if you have to, uh, if you have to win games. And uh, you don't want to play Goran Dragic both nights of a back-to-back unless you absolutely have to. What you're doing now is you're putting yourself in a position where, you know, you have lineups and players who are, are battle-tested in big games that can step in for those other players. And, hey, maybe you give Bam a night off here and there. That knee, knee tendonitis flares up again. I, there, the possibilities aren't just endless for figuring out – what your playoff rotation is going to be. But I think it's going to be so key, especially in this season, much like last year with the bubble, that you don't overload these guys. You you don't make some of the, the more veteran players play more minutes than they have to. I don't want to see this team needing to fight down the stretch to get the sixth seed or, or to avoid playing in a, in a play-in tournament, right? And, and you know, I, I want to see this. I would much rather this team settle for a six or a five if, if that's what it ultimately comes to, but make sure you're ascending, make sure you're peaking and make sure that your most important players are able to get a breather and stay in those spots. And, and then Jimmy Butler and, and Goran Dragic and the players that you've acquired are fresh heading into the games that really matter. Yeah, 100%. It's a really good point. It's not just about what players can do what on each night. It's a matter of fact that you can give players, especially when we come closer to playoff time, you can give players limited minutes or nights to fall together. Um, and you can still expect guys to come in all the way down the all the way down the roster here and come in and <clears throat> and make a difference and make you know still contribute towards winning, which is incredible. Uh, quickly touch on Nemanja Bielitsa. Um, again, Mo Harkless, Chris Silva, gone two players that were not really contributing to, at all uh, to, to another hand solid stretch for role playing good NBA player here I mean the, the Heat have done well again haven't they with this deal it's amazing and you know that was the signal that Kelly Olenek was leaving you know what I mean that exactly. happened in the, I, I mean you know and that's that's where like the staring contest between Pat Riley and and potentially Masai uh, Ujiri I it felt like all along Riley had multiple things that he was either working on or, or plans in place and you know, he knew Kelly Olenek was on the way out the bill, out of the building, either for uh, Oladipo or for Kyle Lowry, however that was going to end up going down. And he made sure that this team was going to be restocked and, and that they were going to be okay. I've been a fan of Bielitsa for a while. I, I feel like, you know, he's someone that when he gets a chance and, uh, you know, he'd obviously fallen out of the rotation there this season. Um, you know, as you understand, Sacramento's going young. Well, he comes to Miami and he instantly becomes – 
a, a different version of who Kelly Olynyk was. I don't. He's not. He's not going to be the creator at times that Kelly was. Uh, as as awkward as it sometimes looked, uh, but I, I do think that he's going to provide a little bit more stability shooting the ball. And you know, Kelly Kelly would have these games where man, it looked like he couldn't miss, and he'd go eight yeah. for ten. <laughs> he could go eight for ten on contested drifting off twenty seven foot three pointers. And then you have these games where he was wide open and and he couldn't make anything. And and we unfortunately saw a bit of those lately. So with the elites, you, you plug him in and all of a sudden the floor is naturally spaced. You know, he may not move around as much as, as Olenek did, but I don't know that he's going to have to, especially when you have a slasher now like Victor Oladipo uh, going on with another on, on ball player like Jimmy Butler, Bam and Duncan Robinson doing what they're doing at, you know, at the elbow, the, the uh, yep. pick and pop stuff, the, the dribble handoff. I mean, the the element that the reason why Kelly Olynyk was playing next to Bam is because Eric Spolstra loves having that stretch element next to Bam. Bielitsa gives you that stretch element again, and and it's not at the same cost. He doesn't offer those extras potentially on offense that at times Olynyk did, although he can drive at times. Um, but I think it's it's a stable replacement that can play next to him. And assuming they sign Aldridge, again, it just gives you another option there. Yeah, and the Heat saw firsthand not that long ago, um, I think a season high of 25 points or something he knocked down against us very recently. So, yeah, it does seem like another good piece. We've now got options there at the four again. Kelly's obviously been holding that spot down. He now leaves. Do we expect Bielitsa to be a starter? Or, you know, Trevor Ariza was coming and looked very good, very strong. Uh, we've got, um, obviously, LMA that we think is going to happen uh, to all these rumours. So, again, there's options here. Do we see Bielitsa just being a, a, a role player off the bench? Or can he hold down a starting berth? It's a fascinating question. I, I think up <laughs> until they sign LaMarcus Aldridge, I could see Bielitsa starting. Yeah. Um, and, and for this reason, I Spo will tell you a thousand times and then he, he lets it play out and proves it to you. Doesn't matter who starts, it matters who finishes. And I think he likes the idea of having some of those floor spacers early on in the game. And then by the end of the game, you're playing your closers. And I don't, I don't know that Bielitsa is necessarily going to be a closer for this team. Maybe yeah. he, he will be. Um, but again, when you have the, the depth of switchy players, the five guys who we mentioned earlier, plus a Goran Dragic, um, plus a Tyler Hero. I, I mean, like you're, you're at Duncan Rob I mean, I, Duncan Robinson – can play with four of those other guys down the stretch. If it's him and, and those four switchy guys. Yeah. So you've already got a number of players who who are gonna who are gonna close. So I don't know if the elites closes, but he may be one of those guys who who opens it and he allows you to kind of uh, manage and manipulate the minutes for the rest of the guys who you are gonna want to close the game. Uh, you know, you're not playing if if Ariza's coming off the bench, well, the good thing about that is he's not getting the minutes early in the game. So he should be ready late in the game. Same thing for Iguodala. Same thing for um, LaMarcus Aldridge, if, if indeed they do sign him and decide to start Bielitsa. So um, I, if I had to guess today, I would say he will start. And I would also say that he'd be one of those starters who, who you know, you're going to look at his minutes at, in the box score at the end of the game. And it's going to be very similar to Kelly Olenek. And, and he's unlikely to finish those games. As you say, it, 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 is, it matters who, who closes and there are so many options now. It is so exciting. So it has been an A-star trade deadline for, for the Miami Heat. Um, just looking forward now then quickly. So, I mean, this is a team now that will be, shall we say it, expected to repeat last year's successes. Can we make a run to the finals? I'm sure this is, you know, this hasn't been done for nothing. We're, we're doing it because we were in win now mode. Is this team yeah. win now ready? I, yeah, I think so. And I don't, I don't think I sit here and say, hey, they are the best team in the East now. They are going to go out there. But guess what? I didn't say that last year going yeah. into the playoffs. I, I, frankly, I thought the Indiana series would probably be maybe a six-game series, five, six-game series, because uh, I thought the guards were going to give them trouble. Um, I, I, thought, I thought they would probably lose to Milwaukee in six. Um, maybe if things fell right, they, they'd push them to seven. And, and I thought Boston was going to be way too strong. So, like, I, I think what, what you have to have happen is, once again, like what happened last year, you need to have the, the whole be greater than the sum of its parts with, with this group. And I think what they've done is you're always looking above you in the standings and not because you want to catch those teams in the regular season. You want to look at the teams that you're going to have to play come playoff time. And I know I'm a broken record on this, but who else in the Eastern Conference now 
can match the number of long, switchy, smart defenders uh, that can go up against Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and, and Kevin Durant. Um, you know, I think Trevor Ariza now, I, I think they really miss Jay Crowder this year. I think Ariza is ultimately going to give you as, as close to a reasonable facsimile. He's not as strong. Out. He's not, you know, he's, he's longer, uh, thinner than Jay Crowder was. Crowder was strong and bulky. So he was able to fight Giannis down on the block a bit. Ariza, though, I think gives you, along with Iguodala, guys who can make Giannis's life miserable. And, and you know, not that Gian- Giannis is a great player. He's going to get his. Um, but they're going to make him work. And, yep. and Bam Adebayo, obviously. So like, you've got these players that you can throw at them, throw out a Drew Holiday, throw out a Chris Middleton. Um, you know, if, if if Boston ever figures things out, throw out a Jason Tatum and a, and a Jalen Brown. Philly, man, like I, I like the idea now, if you go to LaMarcus Aldridge, you're you have Aldridge and Bam, two two very different defenders to go against Joel Embiid. Um, you know, you have players who can who can get in Ben Simmons's face. You have players who can uh, switch over on Tobias Hair. So you know, I you have to look at the teams above you and say it's not as much about whether or not the Heat are better than they are. It's yeah. how do they match up and how would they beat those teams in the playoffs? And that's where you fall back on, on your coaching, your scheming. And, and now that, that veteran savvy with those talented players that you've been able to add. Yeah, just brilliantly summarized. Uh, always I'm doing is just sitting here nodding along because yeah, that, that, that's the thing. It doesn't that's matter. That's my tepid take. That's my tepid take. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, no, that was, uh, as I said, it's, it's all about just the match up. And you like to think now that with what, what Miami have done, especially as you just said there, if we can add uh, Lamarcus Aldridge in as well, you feel like we've got a match up for anybody. And that's uh, exciting. That's exciting. Very quickly before I let you go, Clay, um, there. We're, we're currently, despite all the positivity, we're currently on a five-game losing streak. Um, <laughs> uh, last night looked good, though. That was one of the most exciting games, yeah. considering we only had nine players against a full-strength Portland team that contains two stars, one of a superstar. Um, I thought we'd done exceptionally well. It was great to see players like Duncan Robinson feel a bit looser. Tyler Hero looked like the best I've seen him since the bubble. Um, so this is really sort of screamed out that it's players that are now safe and can concentrate on basketball again. Would you agree? Oh yeah. And you know, in addition to that, to me, and I, I know I'm, I may be, you know, <laughs> an army of one on this. <laughs> I don't feel like, I don't feel like having a, getting a big man was this team's biggest need and Aldridge would help out a lot. I don't, I don't buy into the, all oh, this team needs rebounding. Like you saw it down the stretch. I know they, you know, uh, Enos Cantor was getting some rebounds against them late last night. That doesn't happen if you have defenders who can keep guys from getting into the paint. I've felt from the beginning before this trade deadline, they needed to address two issues before even thinking about getting a big man as being their, their number one choice, backcourt defense and shot creation. Mm-hmm. And, and Victor Oladipo brings that in spades. And, and so the fact they were able to, to bring in somebody who gives them exactly what they need, yeah, they're on a five-game losing streak, but you're bringing in somebody who is going to fill those needs that have led to to losses in those games. In addition to what you just said about guys being tight and missing wide open shots, and now they can settle in. And I, I'm not I'm not picking on Kelly Olynyk, man. He was he was a great a, a great addition. I, I I don't even think he was overpaid. I, I ah. feel like yeah, a great presence in the locker room. Did whatever the team needed of him. I do think that this probably wore on him a little bit. I, I think. Uh, there's an inconsistency that's that's always been there with his shooting, and it, it's just who he is. And um, you know, now you bring in somebody who I think is going to be a little bit more consistent in Bielitsa, and then Robinson knows he's staying, and Tyler Hero knows he's staying, and so I think it's going to be a bit more of a calm there. There's there's less thinking, you know, and and more reacting and more playing, and um, you know, in addition to to filling what I thought was this team's biggest need. So you're right. I mean, I'm not we're not trying to put put cherry on a five game losing streak Sunday here and, and say that everything's fine. But I think you can look at it and say the issues that this team needed to address and the things that, that needed to be fixed, they did just about as, as good as you could have hoped for addressing those issues without creating holes elsewhere. 
Yeah, a thousand percent. And I'm always here for a bit of Kelly O'Linick love. As I said, he's been great for this team. Um, I agree with you. I don't think there was an overpay there at all. We we made a habit of overpaying uh, in the recent future, but uh, sorry, in the recent past. But Kelly O'Linick wasn't one of them. So I wish him uh, I wish him all the best. And I think he'll he'll find he'll have no problem finding a team next year. That's for sure. So uh, Clay, that was one of the easiest podcasts I've ever had to do. <laughs> it was just great to just sit there and listen to you in full flow. Um, loved having you on. Where can everybody find you if uh, if they don't know on Twitter? Uh, at ClayWPLG and then Local10.com, we stream all of our, our sports. I just, I feel so comfortable because like I'm, I'm used to like having to tell people at the outset, look, I'm not, I'm not the hot take guy here, man. I'm not going to like come on here and like scream, oh, the, the Heat are going to go 0 and 70 this year, however many games, 0 and 70. To, like normally, normally people want the podcast, they want a lot of screaming. And that's just, so w- when you said at the outset, you have a show called Tepid Takes, man. I was like, oh, I'm made for this. I'm like, I'm built for that. I, I can be as tepid as you need. Brilliant. Uh, well, anytime you want to jump on, you are more than welcome. It was great fun. Um, that'll wrap up today's episode. Really appreciate talking to you, Clay. Um, we'll hopefully do this again sometime. But yeah, it's exciting times ahead for the Miami Heat. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Please check us out on all podcast platforms. Give us a little review if you enjoyed the show. We've got episode 50 coming up next. Um, we're going to try and do something a little bit special for that, but uh, I'll confirm near at a time when we've got some more details. But until then, guys, enjoy this new era and we'll be back next time. See you soon. You've been listening to Heating Up the UK. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts to ensure you never miss a show. Also, go give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by finding our page at the Miami Heat UK. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, Miami Heat UK TV, for our latest shows and fun content. That's your Miami Heat from across the pond. Covered. Thanks for listening.